Well, good afternoon. Um, again, I'm Rick, and I'm the director of SEED Programs. You can find our website, and I can rattle off the link, but I'm not because uh, we're at a university and it gets to be fairly lengthy. So, but we do have a hemp page on the Seed Grower Association uh, site, uh, giving a list of varieties that are available. Uh, we also have an application process for companies or people that are interested in getting their varieties into seed certification, which is one of the reasons that I am involved with industrial hemp. It is out of the beckoning and the interest and the demand of the industry at that time and the Department of Agriculture. So I've been involved with industrial hemp discussions and growers since um, sometime in 2015. The Colorado Legislative Assembly passed legalization uh, pilot program for the state in 2014, but we were not allowed at the university to talk, discuss, or be involved in anything to do with this crop until legal counsel decided one day that prosecution has been defunded so you can talk all you want. <laughs> and that's what the words that they specifically used. And it's really interesting because I was asked to come and talk to a group of the extension people in Brookings, South Dakota last September because they were interested in him. And it was a closed meeting of administration and extension people on the, on the edge of campus. And there was a real disclosure before we started the meeting that this conversation, what goes on here, does not go out of the room. So they're at that point. So you can feel privileged that you can at least talk about it. And that goes, and that goes quite a way. Um, so, but since we've become involved, initially we worked with the Department of Agriculture um, in a, as a liaison with seed certification. It really matches up well with this crop because what do you want when you buy seed? You want to buy seed that meets your expectations. And seed certification is a method, a uh, process of maintaining maintaining genetics so that you, what you buy is what you get. It's been a process that's been in place for over a hundred years. In 1916, initial seed certification standards were talked about uh, by Canadians and U.S. Uh, people that are involved in colleges, land-grant universities that were developing varieties and releasing them to the public and they would release a variety of the public and it would become lost because there was no process for maintaining genetic purity. You think about it. If you don't have a process for maintaining genetic purity, seed gets planted, gets harvested, gets planted pretty soon and you don't recognize it. And that's what seed certification is all about. So here's the description. And I'll be sharing this PowerPoint so that you can go back and burst yourself. Seed certification is not just an affidavit that you would get from a lab that's testing for THC or testing the seed viability. It's a process of not only field inspection, but seed inspection, and it's done by a third party. So keep that in mind because we have seen over the past couple of years, a lot of fraudulent ideas, comments, inconceived marketing that indicates that hemp seed or hemp plants are certified just because they pass the THC evaluation test. Not the case, not the case at all. I talked to a, a, a grower of hemp from Illinois and he was asking me about certifying varieties and he was wondering if he had bought certified seed because it come from Colorado and he was inferred to him it was certified. No, he was showing me paperwork that he would send me pictures of. No, 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 no. And he spent close to $450,000 and he bought something that he thought he was getting something else. Think about it. 
So we worked with the Department of Agriculture out of the need for a process to get varieties, industrial hemp varieties into seed certification. Primarily first, our first varieties that we had through the, our application process that is on our website. And we have a committee review that's made up of industry, uh, university and, de and Department of Agriculture people that we review applications first. And once the applications have been reviewed and passed that step, then seed would be submitted to a statewide in the state, a trial in five different locations to evaluate that germplasm, that variety that's potentially coming into seed certification to see how it would perform and what the THC levels would be at different locations across the state. So we created this process and it's still going on today. And it seems to be working and screening out the poor germplasm. I can safely tell you that of the applications that we initially received from all over the world and from people developing varieties within the state or adjoining states, that less than 50% make it through the process. So we have a vetted screening process. Once it's through our process and then a crop is grown, it's been field inspected, the seed's been inspected and passed testing, along with that THC evaluation trial that takes place at the initial entry of that variety into our program, we will issue seed tags certified tags. So that's what, it's not a simple, it's not just a affidavit. It is a process of evaluation. And our field inspections are carried out two times during the season. Two times. How many know why? Let's speak. What? Go ahead. Sure. Um, this THC changes over time. No, no, because uh, our seed certification standards are based on phenotypic characteristics and not THC. We use THC as a benchmark. If the crop doesn't pass that test, we're not gonna issue tags, but it isn't a real standard in that we inspect it twice because what we're looking for the first time is the ratio of male to female flower in the field. And I'll explain that in a couple more slides. But male, males, flower, they start excreting pollen. They're usually 10 days ahead of the female. So there's a time period when the male is visible, it's excreting pollen, and the female is not receptive. We need to look at that field at that point in time to make sure that the ratio of the two different sexes is within the variety description. Okay? It's not just a weed that's more complicated. This is a very complicated and intense crop, and thus it's very genetically diverse. It has a lot of product potential, but it is not simple. So we do that first inspection to ensure that the male-female ratio is correct. Then the second inspection is done about three weeks later. Three weeks later, we look really at what's the final, what's the final numbers on the ratio, and we look at weeds. So we have field standards that have been, first of all, adopted by a OSCA nationally, and we adopted them in, in Colorado, and they will, they will apply in Wyoming too, because Wyoming seed certification is a member of AOSCA, just as Colorado. These are the minimum, minimum standards, and if the state of Wyoming seed certification program wants to make them more stringent, they can, but these would be the minimums. So we have land requirements and land history. A lot of that isn't too much of an issue because we don't have tobacco here in the, as a location. Um, fields to be planted in a manner that can be inspected. We have to be able to walk through the field. It's a large plant when it grows and you have to be able to look through the field at individual plants. Isolation is huge because of the prolific pollinator. Impurities are based on 10,000 seed count and we need a purity of German of 98% uh, on the seed standard and 80% on germination. And we'll talk about germination in a second. And then the THC is with the Department of Agriculture. Now there's two distinct types, 
myaceous and dioecious. Myaceous types were really developed in Europe, and they, a lot of French material, French material are myaceous types. Male and female flowers are on the same plant. The off types that are in that type of crop of the myaceous types are the two male plant that are, have a female flower at the top and the rest of the plant is male, or we have the all male that are huge, tall, stick out, or we have the males that are knee high. Those are the real off types that are in it. The rest of the plants are generally mixed. Dioecious types are usually shorter for oil. That's what really come out of Canada, the germplasm that's, that's been developed in Canada since 1999 is that was legal up there at that time. And uh, the Canadians had a federally and a provincial funded uh, programs and there's companies that worked on developing shorter varieties primarily for grain production. And it, uh, up until 2016, they had produced between 250 and 275,000 acres. Primarily, it was handled by two processing companies in Canada, and you can buy those products. You've seen them in Walmart, Sam's Club, Costco, hemp nuts, hemp hearts, health food stores. And when I tell people that, they like, what? That's where they come from? Most people don't know it. But anyway, so we have the two distinct types. The dioecious are male plants or female plants in a true sense. Then we have the hermaphrodite. This is a plant that can change sexes under stress. Okay, that's what makes it unique. Well, there's a lot that makes it unique, but that's one of the things. And that's one of the, that's one of the opportunities with this plant that allows feminized seed production. So here are some of the pictures of the flowers and the plant parts that we look at. We got the male, these are pollen sacs. Uh, we got the hermaphrodite, which would be on the plant, you would identify the top part as a female flower and underneath it's developed male pollen sacs. We have the pistils over there and a picture of the male over there. So it's an interesting plant. You can see these different subtle, different parts of the plant when you're in the field. And it's amazing to walk into a field and see this hermaphrodite plant, how it's changed over time. So what makes it a challenge? It's daling sensitive. So it likes to go from vegetative to reproductive on the longest day of the year, starting with June 21st. So if you're planting early, you're gonna get more vegetative production than if you plant later. Um, harvesting grain varieties, harvesting for fiber. They're all different practices. These are the management skills that if you decide to grow this crop and you're growing this crop, it's just not like wheat and corn. You need to understand the biology of this plant. You need to understand the growth habit of this plant because if you have a different purpose for it, which you're gonna grow it for, you need to understand it. The seed oil content is pretty high. Grain storage, it's an oil crop, so it needs to be dry. The same with you're gonna bale or compact the plant residue, the stalk stem, you're gonna have to have that dry. It's gonna mold. This crop is really subject to molds in the field and in the seed. Um, and the bushel weight, 44 pounds. The one piece that's not up there is the <coughs> seed size. Seed weight, is about, uh, seed size is about anywhere from 30 to 50,000 seeds in a pound. <coughs> so it's got, it's, it's a fairly light seed and subject to uh, mechanical <coughs> damage through handling. So we've got challenges with this. One of the challenges we did find out was what was the top reported disease in Colorado last year, and that is beet curly top virus. That was, out of a survey of 65 samples, that was number one, it won first prize. They also found was Fusarium pseudomonas pythium. We don't know the fertility requirements. The Canadians, the Canadians indicate that you should fer, uh, fertilize it like you would a high protein spring wheat. Water consumption, we surely don't know that, but 
These two items down here, there will be some research done at different universities beginning this year especially, looking at those two components and how important they are. Water consumption, we know it doesn't use more, need more than corn, but we know it probably needs more than wheat. So it's somewhere in there. It's all by guess. There's a great insect website, Dr. Whitney Cranshaw has uh, up, updated and populated this, and it's a super, super good website to go to. So here's a picture, a picture of the plant. And as you can see, we've got a lot of mature seed on there. We've got some immature seed. This is another agronomic problem. The seed doesn't all mature at the same time because it's not all pollinated and the seed's head is not at the same time. So you've got immature and mature seed. Okay, if I, if I harvest too early, I'm gonna have poor seed viability because I'm gonna have immature seeds. I could have mold problems. I could have moisture problems. I could have a number of things. If I wait too long, I have seed shattering going on and the seed is laying on the soil in the field. So you've got issues. Here's a picture of a combine harvesting uh, for seed left. This is one of our seed growers. And the combine is sitting because it's broke down. So if you have a combine and you're harvesting this crop, be prepared to learn to be a mechanic and a welder. Because it's a very, it's a very, what do you call it, durable crop. So it can be hard on equipment. We have on our website, as I pointed out before, a website. These are the varieties that have been through our review process, have passed the THC evaluation process, and they are eligible for seed certification. Does that mean that there's seed available? No. But some of these, there is, there is seed available. Um, this is a picture of the, our, the 2019 evaluation trial um, at, just at RDEC, north of Fort Collins. Um, so here's a couple of pictures of a couple of plots. Um, at the same time, this was like September 20th, right before that one freeze. But you can see the male plants. If you see the male plants, I told you before, they flower before the female. They also die first too, so they're easy to identify. Cannabinoids. So this industry, the indus industrial hemp industry, has kind of turned itself inside out the last three years. So now the focus is on CBD production, which that's the direction that the industry is moved to because of profitability. And it, it seems to be a kind of human consumption, human consumption, and the retail market is really in demand for that. So it was, keep in mind, you know, that CBD was really only identified as an isolate in 1963. THC the following year, 1964, by an Israeli scientist. That's pretty amazing because I'm older than that. And so it's, it's, it's amazing that we have this crop that's been around and it was named cannabis sativa in 1753. And we have these components that were only identified in 1963 and 64. That's pretty amazing what the discovery, what's still going on. And there's a whole gob of cannabinoids that haven't been identified in this plant. So it's really unique. So there's extraction methods. Um, we got, there's basically three different methods. Steam, using water, then we've got a solvent extraction, which has an issue because of the heavy metals and the other uh, components that it may leave behind into a food market. And then we have the uh, CO2 extraction, which uh, is by far the most efficient. Here's a picture. Uh, Brad will be talking. He'll be on the panel in the next session. But anyway, here is a picture of the field out at their farm uh, by Sterling. And they had uh, quite a few acres growing for CBD. These were feminized plants. And um, they seem to be having high enough management level that they're successful. I have talked to many that become <coughs> overwhelmed and become distraught because of financial burdens, because of management skills. They, they aren't able to handle this crop. It's not for the faint of heart by any means. And I tell you, it works very well if you can do it all by hand because you don't have any issues. 
But once you start to get to a commercial size farm operation, the equipment is not quite there yet. So we'll move into the seed. So here are the regular, uh, for any crop, seed quality parameters that we recognize. Industrial hemp has one that sticks out significantly, and that is seed dormancy. You may, just, you, may under, you may not know what seed dormancy is, but recognize it's a plant mechanism that's utilized by native species to survive over different environments and different years. And this crop seems to have some of that in certain germplasm, certain variety lines. It's more significant than others. We've seen as high as 80% dormancy in seed samples with a common number between 10 and 15%. That has been bred, the dormancy issue has been bred out of all of our field crops commercially, uh, for, and it has been done a number of years ago. So at the Colorado Seed Lab, uh, we do a testing for purity and uh, germination, and that's how that dormancy issue came up. We are the first lab in the U.S. to identify that that's a problem. Um, so we're working on methods and I have, the next slide will go to that. No, I guess it's not, and then next slide after that. So we've got some, um, yeah, it grows quickly, three, four days. So here's a slide I was talking about dormancy. So we uh, identified a couple of methods. One is a pre-chill, which would, uh, hold the seed, you dampen it, you put it in a uh, cool, cool, cool dark space for a period of a few days, a week, like uh, winter wheat is done with. Or you can use a potassium nitrate, and that's a solution that's put onto the blotter. You put the seeds into it, and it helps break dormancy. That works on a lot of wheat grasses, and so that helps the process. So that changes the numbers. So these are changes to AOSC, AOSA seed testing rules for this crop that are coming to that organization this summer, they'll be discussing that. So how you tell if it's uh, dead or not is you use a tetrazoleum solution, you cut the seeds, and with the soak solution that, if it's live tissue, it'll turn color, it'll turn red, and then that'll indicate that the seed is alive. If it doesn't, then the seed is dead, 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 dead. We also been uh, also have found that some of the seed may be impermeable to water or anything else, and we refer to that as hard seed. So, what we really got out of that and understanding is that if you're buying seed from someone, it would pay you well to get the seed tested by a professional seed analyst to make sure what you're buying, what you're getting, what you're buying. So that's what we do recommend. The lab uh, at Fort Collins, which is located at the RDAC Research Center, has done over 350 hemp samples since last July. So we're getting a feel of what's in the market, what's coming, what's coming. And they come into the lab from all over the U.S. So we get, we get a wide variation. So we created a process for seed certification to bring hemp varieties in. Moving forward, we are, uh, because of industry demand, not only in here in this region, but in other states, um, including uh, North Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, there's a demand for a certification program for clonal production. So we are looking at creating standards for clone production, and also feminized seed production. We are all looking at, clo uh, at, at standards to cover that. So our program then would have made, be a third party verification of not only the germplasm where the mother plants would come from and the mother plants, but then the clonal production that's done off of the mother plants, that process, and then the process of the feminization which the feminization uh, amounts to, from the clonal production, you would make a population of clones, take a certain percentage of that clonal production, 10, 15, 20%, depending on the germplasm, 
and your experience, because this is veritable on depending on variety, you would apply a chemical, uh, a silver compound, a silver colloidal compound, or a silver nitrite. There's a, a silver sulfate. There's a number of different compounds that could be applied to this plant. And what it would do, it would reverse sex on it so that it would create pollen sacs. And what, why does that do that? It's because that stress re, uh, reduces or eliminates the ethylene manufacturing, the amount that's in the plant, puts it under stress, and that stress then creates these pollen sacs. So why do they call it feminized? It's because you're, you're making a female plant create male pollen, and that pollen does not contain a male chromosome. Thus, you pollinate your other plants. The seed that's produced out of that population will then produce primarily 99% female plants. If you use regular seed, the mix in most dioecious varieties will be 50-50, maybe have a 35% male, but you would have a significant male population that if you're going to raise it for CBD production, you can't have male pollen in that population or in that field at all. So this becomes, it's a, comp it's a complicated process, but we are working on creating standards to help the industry along to ensure some consumer confidence and, and protection in that realm. Questions? Thoughts, comments? Comments? Do you have an abundance of graduate students volunteering to help? Do you have an abundance of graduate students volunteering to help? <laughs> you, at the student level in a university, the interest in industrial hemp is huge. It's huge. It's, it, it's, some, it, it's huge. There's a real strong interest in this industry because they see it as a frontier. And this crop, this crop for agriculture, for urban agriculture, for small farmers, it's great. What I've seen successes are people that integrate their, integrate their farms so that they have, they're growing, they're processing, and they're marketing. And Brad's going to talk about that. But that's where you see the successful. The unsuccessful ones I would describe as, I'm going to plant some hemp seed. I got some money. I got a field. And I hear it. I hear it from a legislator told me. I planted 50 acres, and it, was, it looked pretty good. But then the weeds started coming in June, and the company that I contracted with came out and said, well, we don't want that. And he said, so I got this mess. What happened? There's no, he had no management skills for this crop. So I get a number of people that call from around the country, and they want to know about him. And they have these grandiose plans that they're going to raise a lot of acres. And I tell them all, and I would recommend to anybody, start small at a level that you can manage, that you can understand the biology, the, the growing pattern of this plant, so that you understand what you're doing. Because a lot of times people get overwhelmed, overwhelmed or financially in a pickle. I talked to a guy in two days ago that was going to produce feminized seed and him and his partner got into a, got into a heated argument and one kind of had a mental breakdown because what they did, it didn't work out there. They couldn't get the, they couldn't get the uh, feminization to go through. So they couldn't get pollen created and they lost their whole production. Consequently, he said, I'm out $100,000. So you, you need to understand. So when you talk about starting off small, what is your definition of starting off small? Acreage wise? Or even... Two, you know, five, ten. Two, two acres, five acres, or ten acres. And, and I can tell you from one person that the first year they started out with ten acres, it was two people as a partnership raising him. And they did it all by hand, and he said, we couldn't have handled it anymore. 
He said, I hold and hold and hold and hold and hold. Now, keep in mind that from CBD production, I talked to a grower in Oregon, and he planted, he got, uh, he bought his seed for a dollar apiece, started in the greenhouse, he grew for a month in the greenhouse, and then they transplanted to the field. He said, don't do that. Two and a half weeks in the greenhouse, that's big enough. This plant is very susceptible to damage when it's small. Canadians figure 20% loss if you're planting from seed because of adverse conditions. And that's very realistic. But he started, he started the, uh, them in the greenhouse and they transplanted to the field June 1. In September, they went to harvesting and they harvested, uh, he said, they used uh, tree chippers. They ground everything up. They hauled it to a hops plant. Hops plant dried it down to 12% moisture. And he had produced uh, 16,000 pounds of biomass that he was ready to market for $10 a pound. $10 a pound, and he didn't have any takers. He was gonna reduce the price to $6.50 a pound because that's his break even price. And he said, I need to sell that to break even because I took my retirement, the kids college money, it's in that crop, it's $100,000, four acres. That's not a very long retirement. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what he had. And he said, uh, he said, so that's my break even point. The saving grace he said that I have is that which I had no idea about this. They call it the smoking market in Oregon. He said we hand picked branches, we dried them before we chipped up uh, the field. We dried them, and he said we we can market that. We can sell it by the ounce. And he said I think I can get eighty thousand dollars. So he said the first thing that I would tell you, he said that I wish I would have read a book about how to grow this crop. <laughs> The second thing I tell you is that next year I'm going to write a book and I'm going to make more money into my book than I'm going to make on the hand. Yeah. He said, I do feel lucky at this point because his neighbor across the fence didn't get around to harvesting his hemp, and it rained and it rained and the mold set in and he said it's still there because it's absolutely worthless. So the advantage, the advantage of where we live is that we don't have those kinds, kinds of issues and problems with mold and weather like some parts of the country do. So there is a bright side. So this, this crop is... So, so Rick, one more thing. How about A's planting? Because with all the concerns about crops going hot and when you can actually get someone out to do testing and... Yes. What, what do you know of anyone who's had success with phase planting to try to manage that risk? No, no, people haven't really managed that. I do, uh, one thing I do want to mention that if you're going to grow hemp, there is equipment, handheld equipment, I guess, and I don't know how accurate it is, but taking samples of your plant and understanding the curve of escalation of THC in it is extremely important because all genetics act differently. There was a research paper done the last July that was published accounting and, 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 and relying on 80% of the THC level is due to genetics, 20% to other factors. And keep in mind that THC and CBD are genetically in the plant connected. There is a relationship. There is a relationship. At some point, 10 years, that may be different, but now there is a relationship. Uh, but the issue comes with testing is that when the new, when the new rules go into effect for 2021, if the federal government doesn't change their rules, they're gonna re require every field to be tested. And they have a specific time, like I think it's within 30 days of harvest. So if, 
huh? 15 days. So that we, we, we put in a, we put in a note to expand that. But and so when you take into account that every field needs to be tested and there's a specific timeline in the uh, maturity of the plant, that becomes someone that's a real bottleneck and a real agronomic challenge for growers. But getting familiar and comfortable with who you're purchasing your seed or plants from, getting comfortable with the biology of the plant, these are all responsible, responsible uh, things that, that as a grower that you should follow through. Get that relationship and get an understanding of what you're doing. I do have, before I, before I back away here, I do have some handouts here from the, that the Department of Agriculture in Colorado had from their update. And I do have the differences between what they did in 2020 or 2019 and what they're going to do in 2020. So there's some differences. But understand, and by all means, if you're involved in growing industrial hemp, don't ruin it for or the rest of us by doing something that you know is not legal or not in compliance by any means. We want to keep this a valuable and viable industry. So follow the rules. 